the only way to exchange tokens was using centralized exchanges, which was entirely against the ethos of the whole thing. And of course, that is not the way it's intended. And uh, it's in some sense surprising, but uh, there are some problems that the technology itself fails in or has that makes it difficult. So in principle, no, I'm somehow not sure why it shows, doesn't show me this. Sorry, give me just one second. Um, it should not look like this. Just, uh, I want you to see everything in all its beauty. Sorry about that. Just a one second delay. There we go. All right, because you don't need this video. Uh, so now, in principle, can you write? You can write a limit for a smart contract. All, all that it is is a set of instructions, right? Say, you know, I put the shares up here for sale. If somebody is willing to give me money, send it to the contract, make an appointment call. But the problem is that first, this costs fees every time you do it, and secondly, you know, you have to then all of the nodes have to process these transactions. So this is ten thousand nodes. Nobody wants that, right? But it's extremely inefficient. So this is why this really didn't happen. I mean, there's an example here, which is Ether Delta. In Ether Delta, this actually did happen, but it was never successful. And then on came the so-called automated market makers, um, which are like Uniswap, SuperSwap, and many of the other tools that exist that came into this. And the idea is actually quite beautiful and simple because all that people do liquidity by the tools, they transfer assets, transfer assets into a pool, and then people who want to trade, they go to this pool and send in one type of token and receive another token out. Now, my research area is market microstructure. And market microstructure is interested in the plumbing of markets. It means the institutions and how they shape outcomes. Um, you know, because you know, if you if you don't do market microstructure and you do normal finance, you know very little about this. We usually assume that there's a market, there's a market price, the market price comes together and miraculously, you know, we get an outcome. Um, in, in market microstructure, we look at the details of how it works. And so for market microstructure, it's quite exciting because. First of all, there is a, a brand new institutional arrangement. You have, to have uh, pools of liquidity. You can trade against these pools of liquidity. And then there is a, another feature, which is new, which is the pricing function. So there's a very specific pricing function. I'm going to talk about that in the output. I'm going to talk about that too. And that too is very interesting from a microstructure perspective because we've not seen this function before. Now, one thing I think is important to understand is we need to see this new institutional arrangement against the backdrop of how actually the blockchain is organized. So I'll, I'll come to that in a second. So I just want to show you those. One of the things that I find to be exciting was also the, the user experience. What are you doing? I haven't used it. All what the are you recording? Navigate to the website to connect your wallet. Mm -hmm. You type in an amount that you want to trade. No, I just logged it in. Within seconds, within seconds, you have your trade arranged. So this is, this is truly phenomenal from that perspective. Now, uh, Alfred has talked about the pricing function already. I'm, I'm sorry, this is a very busy slide. But uh, you know, as economists, I can say you trade along an ISO liquidity curve. I think this would be the picky word to describe it. Basically, all that it means is you take a certain, put some tokens into a contract, or you want to take tokens out, you have to pay a specific price for that. Right? So the price is going to be by that function. So now, the thing that, however, when I saw this first, when I saw this, uh, you know, about the tool or this, I was, uh, you know, taking the regular economist response, which was, I was recall, how dare these computer scientists come up with some arbitrary function that somehow works in a contract, or you know, and, and how could it possibly have anything to do with markets? Right? Because when you think of markets, you know, we think there's demand, there's supply, there's price, which equilibrates demand and supply. And so this is just a fixed rule. You know, is, this, is there actually any sense in which this could work? That was the first thing that I found to. And then the second thing is, um, so the question, for instance, then arises is if you have this rule in place, it's going to be adequate compensation for liquidity providers. This is a good price. This is a good way how to organize the market. And um, so, in some sense, what I wanted to do in this paper is I want to ask questions of what makes it, what makes something a good pricing rule in an automated system. And I don't have all the answers. It should really be a first step to try to do this. So, and in particular, taking the organization of the blockchain very seriously. And so there are some features that are important to understand and that are problematic about this. Now, the first feature that's problematic is that there is um, the possibility of what in the industry we refer to as sandwich states. 
Um, economists, it's, it's very similar to front running, although front running is a very particular type of activity due to the democracy to cut the model of a trade ahead of its customer, move supply to itself, the customer something at a much higher price. It's not entirely the same mechanism, but it's the same mechanism, it's not entirely the same process. So here's how this works. So you have this pricing curve, right? And so there's a number of tokens X and Y. So there's an A token and a B token. There's X units of token A and Y units of token B. Um, and this is where we're currently at. Now, if you want to buy a number of X tokens, it means that you, then in the contract, there is a number of units, X minus, big X minus small X tokens, which means that somebody has to pray this amount Y prime. Okay. Fair enough. So that's normally how a trade works. Now imagine you would know that somebody wants to trade these X tokens and you would trade ahead of that person, right? So then the other person puts in the two X, the next X tokens, and then you sell it back to that person. Now, if the other, so if you make your first trade, you pay this amount X prime, the second person, the original trader makes the second trade, this would be the amount of tokens in the contract and you can see that person now has to pay a pretty steep price, which is this Y double prime up there. Okay. So now the now and this Y double prime is actually now that you go and turn the transaction around. So you do the return trip of your transaction as a front run is also the amount of money that you actually receive into for, for selling those tokens. So that's cash in your pocket. And now in this picture, it's quite clear that this Y double prime is bigger than this Y prime, so which is what you had to expense originally. And so this is profitable. Now um, the problem is, the question is, is that a problem? Now, the answer to that is, so this, by the way, is called the sandwich trade. And actually, given the pricing rule, these trades are always profitable module fees. So there's some fees involved, which I'm going to ignore for this entire paper because it's an old question. Um, so the question is, is this front running or the sandwich trade, are they possible? Now, if the technology will not allow that, then what, whatever, we don't care. But the problem is that the way public blockchains are generally organized is that this is always a possibility. So let me just run you through the process. Normally what happens, somebody makes a transaction, does the swap trade, for instance, sends it to the network, the network validates that the transaction is valid and puts it into the mempool. Now these mempools are public. And so Alfred, for instance, uh, one of the things I think you did is you tried to extract data from actually looking at mempool and, and look at what actually what transactions are coming in. Now, when this transaction are being put into a block, the order in which they enter the block matters. Why? Well, because these swap transactions are based, or the price is based on the number of coins or tokens that are available in that contract at the time. And so anytime there's a transaction happening, the ratio changes and therefore the price changes. And so what the sandwich trade would do is if you take this particular trade here to be the one that we have in question, Somebody could insert themselves with a buy order, if you want, ahead of it and a sell order right after, and therefore sandwich this trade. Now that can happen because this mempool is publicly observable. So you can scan and there are bots that scan these mempools. And thereby when there's a transaction which is sandwichable, if you want, they go and they observe it and then they send the two transactions that I just described into the, to the system. And then it goes into the block and then it gets executed through the block and the sandwich trade, the trader who has been sandwiched makes a loss and the sandwich trader who submitted the two orders makes a profit. So that's fundamentally not a good thing to have, right? So we have, and the problem here is we have set up a pricing function which allows front running, and the system allows front running, so not good. Now, the thing is that in reality, this actually does happen. There's such a thing called minor extractable value, sometimes referred to as maximum extractable value, I just call it extractable value. And so the sandwich phrase allow the sandwicher to extract value from the person who's being sandwiched. And you can see there's, there's a lot of this, there's a cumulative amount is now of the order of $600 million. And uh, in some sense, it's kind of, is a downside for the blockchain as a whole or for the system as a whole, right? Because it kind of threatens the long run viability of it. And uh, so uh, the colors don't come out really nicely here, but the issue is the, so this is, uh, so this extractable value is something which is a general problem in the blockchain. Um, there is a very famous article or medium it's called, you know, Ethereum is a dark forest that describes not this type of sandwich trade, but it tries a particular trade that was extractable. 
Um, and there is um, a whole industry of bots that scan mempools for trades where they can extract value. Now, um, but if you look at this graph here, and this is basically just describes how much of value in blocks has been extracted from which protocol. And so this is Uniswap, this is SushiSwap, this is Balancer, and then you have Curve. So the point here is, is that a lot of value is actually extracted from these particular swap So it is real economic cost. Now, how can we prevent this? So that's the first question, right? So, um, well, you can have a technological defense. So for instance, there's something called the one inch protocol, it's an aggregate protocol that cannot prevent this to some degree because it prevents the same direction trade for a certain number of blocks within the same protocol. So that's a solution. Then there is, a, if you want something which is called trusted mining. So trusted mining means that um, you send it to a miner, the miner commits not to put the transaction into the public network and then um, and not to front fund it themselves. Right? So there's a mechanism to make sure that the miners who participate in this protocol actually are not moving the front funding. There's a, there's a state dominance so on and so forth, there's a punishment mechanism. That's also happening already, and it happened actually after I wrote this paper. It has nothing to do with my paper because the problem that I actually identified is not me, it has been, uh, has been identified by Vitalik actually himself already. Um, there's a, a paper by Agostino and, and his co authors on this topic. So they've actually looked at this and they basically say it can help somewhat, but it actually, unless everybody, uh, everybody with every minor would use it, it actually not, doesn't solve the problem that's entire. Then there's an economic defense that you can have. Um, I'm going to discuss some of that in the paper too, which is you can pay a higher fee to the minor, so therefore deter the fund funding, which is great, but it just means that you send money to the miners again. It's, 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 somewhat of almost, it's another way of how value can be extracted from you. Um, you can specify each protocol. I mean, you couldn't, obviously, I went over this too quickly, but if you put a trade in, you can specify the price impact that you're willing to accept. The problem there is that prices do move all the time. And so you may actually lose on a profitable opportunity if you're too conservative on it. And then also, this fund farming problem can still arise if you put a price impact in that is higher than what you know what you would expect normally to be paying for your price. Um, you can actually extract still an amount from people. And then there is a mechanism design approach. This is for general um, for general value extraction trades. This is my, by my colleague, uh, Josh Gans. Um, so I had a long conversation after the paper around and we both agreed that whatever mechanism he has in mind actually does not apply to the sandwich trades, it applies to the sandwich trades that are described in this back policy. And now the last thing is, is the conceptual defense, which is, can we not find a better pricing? So this is kind of what I'm trying to explore in this paper. And um, let me just say, so the paper that you have in front of you, I make very strong points, but you know, I have found it, but I have. So there's an error in there and I'm wrong. I apologize, but this is just how it works. So it's much more, it's complex, right? And I show you some situations where it can be resolved and others quick. So specifically, um, I'm going to go, let's think about what we normally have in economic and pricing rules, the rules that are actually in play in our normal markets. Um, the first one is what the limit order is, uh, which uh, is also referred to as discriminatory pricing. I use that term. Why is it discriminatory pricing? Well, if you think of a limit order book, the way a limit order book works is as follows. There's orders which are stacked up according to their price. So the first order pays one price. The second order may pay, or if you have a large order, the first portion of your order may pay a different price than the last order, to part of your order that takes it. So in this particular case, you know, you have a share of 400, uh, a trade of 400 shares. The first pays 105, the second 200 pays uh, to one or 10 or six, and then the, another 100 pays 10 or eight. So it is therefore we put to this as a discriminatory. Formally, the way in which, if you want to think about, and this is where blockchain comes in, there's no limit order book, of course, and E3 has a bit of a bin limit order uh, thinking, but the normal swap exchanges want to have a function. And it would basically mean that you have a function and that you pay the integral under that function. Right? So that's one function, that's one form that I'm going to explore. And the second one is the one that we normally think about when we think of markets, right? So you have, uh, you know, you have to submit a quantity, you pay a price, um, and you take the price times quantity is the payment. 
So in this particular case, you can't see this because the color would come out. But so if you would have an order of size Q, uh, so there's a pricing function, which is blue. And what you pay is essentially this square here. Right? So, um, so, so these are the two pricing functions that normally we see in markets. But in many ways, when you think about it, we just hard code, we can hard code them too. And then also a particular institutional arrangement, actually. Right? So this is so I always I thought earlier on how this, this natural price and how it comes along, but really in many situations we actually take institutions for so the microstructure comes in and say this is how people have to act, and then people optimize again what they have to act. Okay, so now um what I next wanted to do is I want to say, okay, let's take the Economist approach and try to find a model so that we can then first derive pricing functions within the model that makes sense and then be able to compare them. Okay. So, um, what I have is a very simple setup. You have an asset that has a true value with the um, expected value and with the, the variance. Um, there is uh, an exogenous demand that comes to the market. Right? So, this is the, the liquidity trade that comes. And there are n identical markets. So importantly, in contrast to what we've seen in our set paper, the paper does not have asymmetric information, it has symmetric information, so they are valid shocks, they come to everybody, and nobody can predict. You know, um, whether or not this is a better model is a, is a different question. In some situations, one is better, it has more applicable than the other. Uh, I would argue, so I want to do just uh, risk compensation for liquidity providers. So uh, then I have my Market makers, these are the liquidity providers also. Um, they have an aggregate, no, so they have a sorry, they have aggregate inventory big I, so it's a typo, an individual inventory, you know, identical inventory, one over I or I over N. Um, they have a quadratic utility of terminal wealth. So the idea being here there is a risk return trade-off that we face. Um, so it's just you know very loosely waving our hands. Um, when you look at the Grossman Miller model from 88. So essentially, there you have a non distribution power utility. So then you know you have a mean variance utility function under that. Doesn't quite work with the because of the demand is uncertain. This is why I just picked the quadratic utility. And then, so therefore, when you want to, and I apologize for the long equation, but when you absorb you know, the total quantity Q that you receive, you receive a fraction alpha of that. Then what you have in your inventory is you have your inventory, right? Then you have sold somebody a fraction alpha Q of that amount. So that is something, this is the capital that you have. This is your terminal wealth. There's a risk compensation component here, which is the standard one that is used in the literature. It comes out of a Picara normal framework. And then you receive a price, uh, which is the entire price P of Q times alpha. Okay, and so now this is the institution. This is the question of what the pricing function comes in. So we could use various different functions for that. So, um, so the three examples that you have is one would be the constant product function that you know Alfred already explained in detail. Then you have the discriminatory price function where there's some integral over function, and then you have the uniform uh, rule where you pay for the quantity some form of price function times the quantity. And so the market maker that wants to now take a decision of whether or not to supply liquidity has to maximize. This expression here, which really just says they maximize over the fraction of liquidity that they're willing to provide in this entire market. And in equilibrium, I can, I think I have this on the next slide. In equilibrium, it has to be that the fraction that he's willing to provide has to be because it's identical as the one over n of the total liquidity. So now here's a, here's a trick, and this is why the constant product pricing is a little challenging for us to So in normal markets, so no matter when we call it uniform pricing, discriminatory pricing, whatever we call it, right? We have the demand has to coincide with supply. So the price has to be such that these two can coincide. Right? So there is the, the supply of the asset will be this alpha, the fraction times the quantity. Um, you know, if you look at the standard model, there's sort of like an X and whatever it is you supply, but it's the same idea. There's quantity demand it has to be equal to quantity supply. That can't be the case with constant product pricing, however, because you know if you had the, the number of tokens in the contract would be coinciding with the number of, um, of tokens that people would be uh, that people would be demanding the price to be infinite, nobody would want to trade. Right? So this is not this is not well defined as a problem. So 
So Christine and, and Alfred have that same problem in their paper. Um, they have a different setup. So they in the paper have a zero profit condition for liquidity providers. I have maximizing liquidity providers. So for me, it has to be the case that if you take the aggregate quantity as given, because the price taker doesn't consider yourself small enough, the amount that you're willing to supply has to be exactly one end of the total amount. So, so that given the price that you then face or the other side faces, what you would see would be exactly all. So that's basically how it works. So it's more, more math and more conceptual that you want to hear, but I think this is kind of important to figure this out. So um, in it, because we have identical market makers as a set, so that you know the fraction everybody wants to have is one over n. It's a simplification, but at least that you know gives you the right intuition. So for the uniform and discriminatory price functions, I hypothesize a linear function in each case. You can probably solve it with other functions, but I mean solve it without not that good in math. I have to use linear functions. And then you have to find the right slow parameters so that it is, you know, that you're willing to supply liquidity one over n. For anybody who has, wants to have a level of comfort, of course, I can also turn this, you know, use the normal solution mechanism that you use with Russell Miller, and you get the same outcome, right? So it's just a little unorthodox what I pick, but it comes to the same outcome. In the constant product function, you have to find the liquidity, the total liquidity willing, that everybody is willing to supply, such that the optimal quantity that you are fraction that you're willing to supply is one over n. So, um, these are the pricing functions in case you want to know. This is basically, this is the standard amount that you normally see in any model of, uh, of liquidity provision is for the uniform pricing. The price that somebody has to pay or the marginal price if you want is true value or the expected value plus the quantity multiplied by the slope coefficient. So think about it, even in the Kyle model, Kyle lambda, that's right? the slope coefficient, that's like this thing. And then when you have an inventory, you know, that you want to unload, you're willing to actually lower the price because the inventory is risk for you, so you rather want to get the right price. And then you can do a similar formulation for the discriminatory price. Uh, you know, all that you do is you just, you know, describe the way how the function has to be determined next. Like for the constant product pricing, it is slightly different because you have to have an integral that you take over quantities. Um, the pricing function is something in the denominator. So the solution for that becomes a little cumbersome. In order to then solve that integral, you can do it with a beta function that has an integer of, um, parameter, for instance. You can probably do it with other functions too, but I kind of think it should be some form of symmetric function over quantities. So you can find it in, you can find an expression for the optimal alpha in closed form. This is the one which goes for the uniform, which is actually what I use going forward. Okay. So just to give you the idea now, so now you know, I talk about lots of theory, but just, you know, this is a, you know, the, the economics professor speaking. So um, what do we do? Um, let's think about sandwich trade first. So the sandwich trade means, is it possible to fund that? The bad news is that the limit order of the same problem arises. Why? Well, so the first trade basically pays this little triangle here. So colors don't come out, but it's not colored. The second trade essentially pays this entire area here. And then when the person reverses the trade, so that's the, that's the selling part, the person also makes the same area here so that, you know, the, much, uh, the, the expectable value is in this little square down there. Rectangle, it's not necessarily. Okay, so in other words, this, it doesn't, so when we think of our standard limit all of us, we go, well, you know, maybe we can find a better price than we can do that. Doesn't happen. Now, if we go with discriminatory price paying, um, it's different. Um, so sorry, this is a little bit, my, my uh, zooming in but doesn't work. So the first trade, that you would make would be this square here. The second trade would be the amount that you have here, but then the return trade is actually this area down here, which coincides exactly with the amount that the originally that you would have had to pay. So in other words, the revenue that received from your return sale is exactly the same as what you paid originally in order to initiate the sandwich trade. So with uniform price, so in other words, with uniform with uni, um, uniform pricing, we can get rid of the extractable value. So that's good. The bad news is though is that if you are a trader, 
and you wanted to um, you'll see that you have to do a large trade. If you were to, for instance, want to trade two Q as an amount, so twice the number quantity, and you trade the entire amount, you would have to pay this entire big rectangle. But if you do the two individually, so you split your order into two, you trade this small area here and this area here, but you don't have to pay for this part. So you're actually earning money for all the splitting here is possible. In the blockchain world, that's not great. But in the blockchain world, that means that you have excessive network traffic. So that's also a problem. So this is why I'm saying it's not, it's hard, hard to get actually the right design. So, and it becomes a trade-off of what the system is most worried about. Is it worried about MEV? So that's a disadvantage for the liquidity demanders. Or are they worried about congestion and also then inadequate compensation for liquidity providers, which could be happening from excessive splitting? So now, in other words, now I have another a third, con uh, third condition, which is basically, does it pay in any way to split liquidity across different systems? Uh, in no case would it do that. So it's always better to have all the liquidity in one spot. That is irrespective of the particular function. I'm sorry about all the math here, but really the question that you have is, if you take two con three conditions that are relevant here, and all of these sort of have this idea of fairness in terms of compensation and not excessive usage of the network. So you have sandwich trades, uh, you, sorry, you have auto splitting, sandwich trades, and split liquidity. The reality is constant product pricing violates the, uh, split the, the sandwich trade condition, but auto splitting is not a problem. Uh, discriminatory pricing has exactly the same problem, you know, has the extractable value, but it doesn't, all of it doesn't pay, and then uniform pricing has splitting. So now, can we, so I, I think I'm going to, I don't know how much time we have, Ken? Uh, you've got 12 minutes. Oh, 12 minutes is forever. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, so um, that has never happened. Um, okay, so now, can we, can we get rid of this economic Right? And so the answer is, oh, what, you know, how do we do this? Um, so one of the things that I alluded, so one thing I know so far is in the that have to be very clear, if they were also large enough, uh, small transactions, the fees that you have to pay just overwhelm what you have to do. So in some sense, the small transaction, the value is not a concern, but when they're sufficiently large, or when the market is sufficiently illiquid, because then you move the price a lot, then it will matter. So, I mean, that's, that's quite intuitive, but then can we also find a way how we can set, can, does the user have any way to defend himself? So the idea is that if as a user, I put in a mining piece, which is sufficiently high, then I can force the person who wants to contract me to pay that mining because they would have to outbid me to be included in the block before me. And so what this miner has to do, or what not this miner, what this, uh, what this contractor has to do is they have to outbid my original fee and they also have to pay a fee to reverse the transaction. They want to do this in the same block because otherwise they face execution risk where they don't know what happens thereafter. So they kind of have to have a fee which is out basically by a little bit. And also they want to not have another fee which is on the return to It's not too much lower than the original fee because otherwise it could be sinking into the next block. So loosely they would have to pay twice the fee. The front rider has to pay twice the fee of what the original trader had. And because you can describe the extractable value in closed form, you can always find a fee such that you can, if the fee is sufficiently high, you can prevent front run. So it's possible, but it just means that the money goes, you know, leaves your pocket too, it makes trading more expensive. Second thing is if the front running is actually done by the miners themselves, then that doesn't help at all because the miner doesn't have to pay a fee. The miner can, there's nothing in the mining uh, law or rules that say that you have to take any fee uh, except for, you know, the non talk about that's and all that. You know, it's just minimal. Anyway. So um, it, nothing says that you have to, that you have to set anything. So you can't defend yourself against miners actually extracting the value and miners are in the business of extracting the value. So in other words, it's, it's not going to help. So um, yeah, um, so there is, a, there is a way around this, but it's not great. So now I've, I've talked a lot about the advantages and disadvantages, and I thought to some degree, let's have a little bit of a look at the data just to understand exactly what are the differences between these things. Okay, because um, it's easy to say, to, to, to zoom in on the economic problem or model problem, which may be not relevant in practice. And so now I, I don't do a full um, econometric analysis here, I just take a few data points um, just to get a sense of what's happening. 
think you know there's probably some value to somebody doing a full analysis, but um, that's not really what I wanted to accomplish in the paper. So what I'm trying to do is then to do the following. I say, let's look at how the trades will occur, how, how much it will cost the liquidity demander, such as it is, given uh, you know, the observed trades that we see in swap exchanges, and then let's see in a hypothetical environment where we can use a different pricing rule, how much would it cost them? So it's more relevant hypothetical because nobody, the system, whatever I propose with uniform pricing, uniform pricing doesn't exist. I'm not comparing it to Binance because as, as, as Christine pointed out, you know, a token on Binance is not a token on Ethereum. It's, 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 I don't think this is, there would be the right point of comparison either. So it's really to ask, suppose we would take whatever, however swapping trading works now, and we would use instead a different pricing rule, and let's find a pricing rule which actually makes sense given all the other, you know, given the environment that they operate in, which one costs more or less. All right, so, um, so what do we need? We need the number of X tokens provided. So in contrast to what Alfred and Christine were doing, I'm using the dollar as a numerator because I can only think in dollars, I can't think of with my, obviously I think in Canadian dollars, it's a challenge all by itself, but um, that, that seems to be a very minor problem for everybody. Um, so um, there's a certain amount of liquidity that has to be provided. Now, um, just one thing, the exchange rate of Y tokens for X tokens without any transaction size and the marginal rate if you want, you can think about that as a fair value. So the value B, the fundamental value, the expected fundamental, the expectation of the fundamental value could be thought of as y over x. So therefore, that you can then say that the y tokens are the product of the b and the x token. So I saved myself a parameter there. Um, there is a volatility that you need, right? So that's the volatility of the price. Um, you need a risk aversion coefficient, and you need the number of liquidity providers that exist. Now, that seems like, how would you get this number? Well, I assume they're identical, so I can actually look at the data and then backtrack uh, out what's happening. So uh, just so you can see where the numbers come from. So there's a few numbers that I can just take as they come. I can look at the, uh, at two, I look at two contracts only. Um, I pick one which is very liquid, which is the ETH contract relative to the US dollar token, USDC token. And I look at wrapped Bitcoin, which is in Uniswap V2, it's a very illiquid contract. I mean, it's still traded sufficiently, but it's, it's pretty illiquid. And look at that one. And so then I want to estimate for these two types of contracts at the extreme end of the, of the, of the spectrum, which one is better. So um, the standard deviation I took, um, I think, the, you know, sort of like wave my hands and say, I take, you know, the average volatility for the month for the year 2020. So that's 260 for ETH and 4,100 4, for Bitcoin, which is roughly right. Um, look at the liquidity that is provided. I can just look at what's in the contract. So there's 38,100 ETH tokens in the contract that I used at the time when I looked, which was, uh, I think, uh, January, early January. And there are 6.25 Bitcoin tokens and an equivalent amount of, of, uh, of USDC tokens so that the fundamental price is exactly the ones that I've listed here. And then there's a the question of, I, I said there's a distribution of quantity over a particular interval. So this is going to be really tricky computationally. And I learned something new about my computer, which is I'm, I'm, I'm very quickly hitting the bound of uh, precision to actually do the solutions for these problems. So um, the entire, the largest trade that I, for instance, saw in terms of ETH is 180 ETH, right? Um, but if I take such a wide interval um, and use, for instance, some form of try to estimate the distribution over the, over this, over the interval, I can look at the data distribution here. I can't solve the problem, the, mo the model anymore, because the, so the, in, in the description, there's some really, you multiply some really gigantic numbers, something to the order of power 30 with one another, and then you subtract them from one another, and the, 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 the sum of these two is very, very close to zero. So it's just my computer precision can't do it. So I just simplify by looking at two ranges. I take 10 and I pick one. Uh, for 10, that captures 92% of the trade. For one, captures almost 60% of the trade. And same here for Bitcoin. Um, the beta coefficient, I just use the uniform. Um, I could use a non-uniform, but um, again, I run into computational issues. The risk aversion coefficient, I take from the literature because it's actually meta-analysis for this. And then I can back out from the, from, the from the equation that I showed you a few slides before. 
what the number of liquidity providers are. So they're roughly 400 for ETH and about 1.2 for Bitcoin. Number, right? So um, now, first of all, the way the model is actually set up is that exactly the price that you exactly expect to see is the same um, for uniform and discriminatory pricing for the, for the respective quantity. Once there is an inventory absorbed by the market maker, the price is changed in the case. But the units, when you go with the starting inventory of zero, it's the same price. And so you can see here the numbers. Um, this is the extracted, so this is the expected price or the price impact, if you want the average price impact, is up to the third digit is the same with uniform and constant product pricing. Three minutes, yeah, I'll be done in two minutes. Thank you. It is almost the same for Bitcoin versus when you have the less liquid contracts, except that it's slightly cheaper under constant, uh, um, slightly cheaper under uniform price. Um, and irrespective of how you pick it. So there's, for the very liquid contracts, it's almost the same. The differences are in the third digit. Um, for um, the less liquid, the uniform discriminative pricing would be cheaper, hypothetically. Uh, the extractable value, there's no extractable value for uniform pricing, of course, but for discriminatory pricing is, is almost identical. So this is, again, there's a slight advantage for constant product pricing at the fourth, at the fourth digit. You can't see this here in the table. It is significantly less, however, for, um, for, the, uh, for the less liquid contract. So discriminatory pricing is better in terms of extractable value. And if you look at the price impact of very large orders, again, the price impact of very large orders is actually lower for the discriminatory or uniform pricing relative to the constant product. So in other words, there's some indication that there are for very liquid contracts about the same, but for illiquid contracts, there's a small advantage in my view, at least in terms of the price for the standard uh, pricing functions that we use in, in economics. So in summary, the AMMs, like Uniswap and so on, are actually major innovation. The, the pooling of liquidity is phenomenal, right? so because as Alfred said, right? so you can get rid of the arms race cost in some sense that we see in stock exchanges where you know obviously trading technology does have externalities to the rest of the world but for you know the high frequency tools where people build microwave towers to shave off the millisecond of the travel time relative to you know fiber optics from Chicago to New York it doesn't strike me as something that you know it is has a greater value. Um, and so in some sense that that really helps and also Potentially, it could help for illiquid securities like corporate bonds. The pooling of liquidity there should be quite powerful. It would allow, for instance, fund managers to earn passive income on the liquidity. So, in other words, you can think about think about this not just in the blockchain world, but also in for, for bigger topics in finance. Right? Um, but blockchain in its setup presents some challenges. Some of them may be addressable conceptually, technologically, but there's also some some issues here with the institutions of how they're being set. So there is no magic bullet to solve this problem, but it seems that if like a, a pricing function like discriminatory price, like the limit order book, then have a minor advantage for very liquid trades. So that's that's what I that's all I have. Thank you.